There have been plenty of royal heads of state throughout the centuries who have had very short reigns due to unfortunate circumstances and poor choices. Some of their stories are quite epic, even if few remember their names anymore. Keep watching to discover the tragic stories behind the shortest reigns in royal history. Anyone who's seen a production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar knows how dangerous the job of Roman Emperor was. Marcus Didius Julianus found that out the hard way in the year 193 AD when he reigned for just 66 days. He'd had a massively successful career as a prefect in general, but things were not well in Rome as the Emperor Commodus was killed by a group of conspiring senators and replaced by a new emperor, who just lasted 86 days before he was killed in turn during a military uprising. The killing was reportedly accidental, but since there was no appointed successor, Didius Julianus strolled in and declared that he was emperor, and everyone pretty much went along with it. Everyone, that is, except for Septimus Severus. When he heard about the self-appointment of the new emperor, he declared that he was emperor and then rounded up his men and headed to Rome. By the time he got there, the Senate already knew their soldiers weren't going to fight the man rapidly approaching, so they bailed, and just in time, as an assassin sent by Severus killed and beheaded Didius Julianus. Russian history between 1598 and 1613 is known as the Time of Troubles, and it started with the untimely death of Theodore I. When he died without an heir, that kicked off a succession debate, and among those contenders were the so-called False Dimitris, a series of pretenders who claimed to be the Prince Dimitri, the youngest son of Ivan the Terrible, who had actually been killed as a child. The False Dimitris had the support of Poland and Russian rebels who thought it was time for a bit of a change, which brings us to Theodore II, who was put on the throne on April 23, 1605. Only 16 years old at the time, Theodore II just as quickly lost the support of the military. When his mother stepped in to try and fix things, that irked the Russian aristocracy, who in turn encouraged a full-blown riot. The rioters killed both Theodore II and his mother in early June, and just two months into his short-lived rule, the throne was wide open to be occupied by the first pretender. Maximinus Thrax might sound like the name of an MCU villain, but he was actually a Roman emperor whose reign lasted just three years, starting in 235 AD. But this story isn't primarily about him. Thrax was obsessed with his military campaigns to the point that the Senate got sick of his spending and decided to appoint someone else as emperor. His replacements were Gordian I and II, a father-son duo who cemented their claim to the throne by having assassins kill Maximinus Thrax's top commander. The Gordians immediately got to work by disbanding the secret police, declaring the former emperor an enemy of the state, and preparing to fend off a military invasion. That invasion happened with the help of a governor loyal to their predecessor who just happened to be in the area. It was Gordian II who led the charge against the advancing army, so he was the one to die first. When word of his death got back to his father, Gordian I immediately killed himself. Their reign lasted only 22 days. Jane Grey was declared Queen of England on July 10, 1553. She reigned for just nine days, and that's not even the most tragic part, as she didn't even want to be queen in the first place. But she was caught up in the soap opera-style drama that was the Tudor family, and she'd been groomed not only to be queen, but a figurehead for the country's relatively new faith of Protestantism. At the time that she was married and then told she was going to be queen, she was only about 16 years old, and she fainted at the news. Grey's entourage, led by John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, installed her in the Tower of London, where they thought she would be safe. But they hadn't expected a rival Mary Tudor to gain so much support so quickly. Just nine days after Grey became queen, the Royal Council revoked their statement and named Mary as the official Tudor heir, and the Tower of London became not a seat of power, but a prison. Grey was held there until February 12, 1554, when she was taken to the Tower Green and executed. Her last words were reportedly, Lord, into thy hands I commit my soul. Being born into royalty doesn't automatically mean a life of luxury. Just consider Francis John I. He was born on November 15, 1316, just five months after the death of his father, Louis X. He was given the nickname John the Posthumous and was crowned king immediately at his birth, but he died a mere five days later. While that was, of course, the end of John I's reign, that's not the end of the story. Fast forward to 1356, when the royal court of France had to deal with the claim that John I hadn't died at all, but had instead been swapped for another baby and raised as a commoner. A man named Juninho claimed to have been told of his supposedly true history by a politician who had died before he could complete his mission of seeing the right monarch ascend the throne. This sounds like the sort of thing that people would just roll their eyes at, and many did. Juninho appeared to the Hungarian royal court for help in reclaiming his so-called birthright, but he was sent away. He only managed to put together a small army of mercenaries to harass the French court, but when John II rose to power, he was largely forgotten. 
When it comes to the Crusades, Western history tends to talk a lot about the Western leaders like Richard the Lionheart. Less frequently discussed are the leaders of the other factions, like Conrad of Montferrat, who was briefly King of Jerusalem in 1192. Conrad had a pretty incredible intellect. If he were a Dungeons & Dragons character, he would have high scores in wisdom and intelligence, as well as the strength of a barbarian and all the charisma of a bard. He was so widely popular that he was elected King of Jerusalem during the Third Crusade by a landslide. Unfortunately for Conrad, that made him a target. After having lunch with a friend one day, he was walking back to his house when he was attacked, stabbed, and killed. One of the assassins was killed instantly, and when the other was tortured for information, he spilled the beans. He was a member of the Assassins, a Shia Muslim sect who lived in the mountains of Persia and Syria. Conrad was king for just four days before he was killed, and Richard the Lionheart was ultimately blamed for hiring the assassins. Not only does the tale of Khalid bin Bargash involve one of the shortest reigns in history, it also involves the shortest war in history. It's a record that's unlikely to be broken, as the Anglo-Zanzibar War of 1896 lasted just 38 minutes. The full story takes longer to tell than the war lasted. The short version is that it started when control of Zanzibar was ceded to the British, who decided to install their own sultan. He died about three years into his reign, and the running theory is that he was poisoned by his cousin Khalid bin Bargash. A good rule of thumb is that if you want to kill someone to usurp their position and avoid suspicion, don't move into their palace and declare yourself sultan before the body is even cold. Khalid started gathering his troops as a precursor to taking on Zanzibar's British overlords, and it was just a matter of hours before the British fleet stationed in the nearby harbor got the go-ahead to employ whatever measures were deemed necessary. Khalid responded by saying that he was sure they wouldn't fire on the sultan's palace, but then the British did exactly that. Just 38 minutes later, the new sultan's flag was down, 500 of his men were dead, and Khalid fled. He wasn't captured until 1916. He was exiled first to St. Helena and then to East Africa, dying in 1927. In June 2001, shocking news emerged from the Nepalese palace as King Barendra, his wife, and eight other members of the royal's inner circle had been killed by a mysterious gunman. On June 4th, it was then announced to widespread confusion that Nepal had named a second king in just two days. Prince Guy Nidra was now regent, following the appointment and death of the Crown Prince Dipendra. A few days after that, it still wasn't clear what had happened, but it was reported that several journalists had been arrested after publishing a story that named the man behind the massacre, Dipendra himself. Stories varied, but it was later reported that Dipendra, who was outraged that his family had denied him the right to marry the woman he'd fallen in love with because her grandmother had been a concubine, simply walked into the palace dining hall and started shooting. He then attempted to kill himself but ended up in a coma, which is when he was appointed King of Nepal. He remained in the coma for three days before he died, and the massacre kickstarted a complete overhaul of Nepal's political construct. And royalty lived as it still does by its very own rules. The infamous Napoleon Bonaparte had one legitimate son with his wife Marie Louise. Napoleon II was only three years old when he became the French emperor for the first time, after his father abdicated in 1814. But there was a bit of a snag, as Napoleon I had officially removed all of his descendants from being in the running for emperor. That's far from the end of the story, though. Napoleon I didn't go away completely, as he returned in 1815. His son was officially a prince again, and then, when Napoleon I was defeated at Waterloo, Napoleon II became emperor again. That lasted for just 20 days, though, and when the French aristocracy refused to recognize his rule, he headed to Austria and was taken under the wing of Francis I, the Austrian emperor who was also his grandfather. He was raised as a prince, and while he was officially the French heir, he never took power and died of tuberculosis at the age of 21. In 1889, King Carlos I took the Portuguese throne, and when he came to power, Portugal wasn't a great place to be. There was plenty of unrest and corruption, as well as a devastating financial recession, which all led to an open revolt. In an attempt to regain control, Carlos decided to try to overthrow the parliamentary government and make it a dictatorship, but it definitely didn't go as planned. Carlos and his son, Luis Felipe, who was just shy of 21 years old, were riding through the capital of Lisbon when they were targeted by an assassination attempt. The open carriage probably made it pretty easy, and Carlos was killed instantly. Louis Philippe was shot and mortally wounded even as the carriage made a run for it, and it was a 20-minute mad dash for safety, during which time the heir apparent had become king. Also in the carriage were Louis's mother and younger brother Manuel, who was likewise wounded in the attack. Despite Manuel's best efforts, Louis died as he was being removed from the carriage, having been king for just 20 minutes. 
check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.